Good day, and welcome to the third day of the 2022 Regulatory Information Conference, or the RIG. This morning, we're going to have a great panel discussion about our experience executing the first Part 52 combined license for Bogor Units 3 and 4. My name is Omar Lopez Santiago, and I'm the Deputy Director for the Division of Construction Oversight in our Regional Region 2 office in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm going to be the the chair for today's panel discussion. This is a busy time for Bogo and all of us, as we work together to ensure that the first new power plants built in this country in over 30 years are safe. With me today, we have the following panelists. First, Zachary Harper. Zach is the manager of Westinghouse Plant Licensing Engineering Team, and his group is responsible for Westinghouse licensing activities related to new plant builds. Next, we have Amy Chamberlain. Amy is the Nuclear Development Regulatory Affairs Manager for Southern Nuclear. In this role, uh, Amy supports Vogel 3 and 4 construction licensing needs. Next, we have Nicole Coover. Nicole is the Branch Chief of the Construction Inspection Branch 1 in DCO, my, uh, in the same division that I work for. And Nicole is responsible for managing the Construction Inspection Program at Vogel's Units 3 and 4. And last but not least, Victor Hall. Vic is the branch chief of the Bogle Prayer Office in the, at the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Regulation, sorry, Nuclear Reactor Regulations, NRR, and he's responsible for licensing and overseeing the construction of Bogle 3 and 4. In today's panel, we're going to be discussing the following topics. We're going to be talking about licensing, ITAC, and you're going to hear that word a lot. ITAP means inspections, test, analysis, and acceptance criteria, the construction inspection program, and applying lessons that we have learned throughout this process to future applications. As a reminder, this is a panel discussion, so we, are, we encourage everybody, the audience, to ask questions to the panelists, and please use the, the chat function in the application. So as an introduction, and to start to kicking, kicking, kicking off the panel discussion, Please, uh, Vic, tell us a little bit about your work with Part 52. Thanks, Omar, and welcome everyone to the Regulatory Information Conference. Uh, so in Part 52, I, uh, I won the Part 52 lottery, and it's the jackpot because I have the best job in the world. And what I mean by that is um, the work that we get to do is so unique and so important to the country that, again, I feel incredibly blessed and lucky to do what I do. So I'm the branch chief for the Vogel Project Office, in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. Uh, I love our tagline in NRR, Nuclear Reactor Regulation, it's we make the safe use of nuclear technology possible. And as you might have gleaned from the name Vogel Project Office, we do that very specifically for the Vogel Construction Project, which is, as Omar mentioned, the first nuclear uh, construction project in this country in over 30 years. So this is gonna sound really corny, I'm gonna apologize, but it's like 8.30 in the morning here in DC and I'm the king of dad jokes. But what we do in the office is kind of magic. Um, it's making safety from nothing. As a regulator, you know, we don't, we don't make a single pump or a valve. We don't design anything. We leave that to Zach and the good folks at Westinghouse. We don't build the plant. We leave that to Amy and the, fun, and the fine folks at Southern. But what Nicole and I get to do is from paper. We create the rules. We inspect. We do, you know, we don't create anything, but we make safety. We're able to, to create the plant, um, make the plant safe uh, through our regulatory structure, through our licensing and through our oversight, which we do at BPO. And that's kind of a cool thing when you think about it. It's like an intellectual pursuit of, of making something safe without actually touching them. And so um, it's, it's a kind of a unique thing and it takes incredibly talented folks to do that. There's a skill, um, there is a, a special knowledge that goes into being a regulator and making that happen. And that's where I feel incredibly lucky because I'm working with the folks in the Vocal Project Office who are just really good at what they do. We have, um, there are 11 of us, we are engineers, project managers, who have since the very beginning of part 52 worked on this unique process um, to make and make the plant safe. Um, part 52 is, is kind of a unique beast. It's uh, the first time we're ever going through this process. Uh, if you've heard me talk about part 50 in the past, you know, it, it was derived from the FCC's regulations on building um, uh, uh, communications towers. It was a separate construction permit for building them and then operating them. So, you know, you're talking about 1950s type regulatory structure. And Part 52, which was born in the 1990s, uh, was meant to standardize plants, bring some stability to the regulatory structure. And you know, we, we now have 20 years of experience of design certifications, combined licenses, 
and a lot of lessons learned from that. And we're in the first kind of stages of this, this overseeing construction at the very end, which is really exciting and getting to see all that come together. So um, in terms of Part 52, uh, my experience is the last four years working with incredible people who have incredible experience and getting a chance to see uh, this plant come out of the ground and be done safely. Okay, great. Uh, Nicole, what about you? Good morning. Uh, as uh, Omar said, I am, uh, my name is Nicole Coover. I am the branch chief in the Division of Construction Oversight in the Atlanta II region office. And I would echo, recall that the folks that I have the pleasure and opportunity to work with every day are just incredible inspectors uh, with skill sets that go um, across many different disciplines and experiences. And when I say inspectors, it's Region 2 inspectors. All of us are involved in, in the Vogel project and performing inspections. So as part of our mission, we regulate and provide inspection oversight of the construction activities for the Vogel Unit 3 and 4 uh, sites that's located in Waynesboro, Georgia. And this is to provide reasonable assurance of adequate protection for public health and safety, to promote common defense and security, and to protect the environment. The Division of Construction Oversight also implements the inspection program, which includes resident and regional inspectors with the support from headquarters technical experts, as the call was referring to. And what keeps us busy, very busy, is the planning, scheduling, and completing of three different types of inspections, which are construction inspections, initial test program, and operational program inspections. The resident and regional inspectors at Vogel, they devote significant time and resources to verify that the licensee's construction and completion of inspections, tests, analysis, and acceptance criteria, as Omar said, said, we will say that a lot today, is what we call ITAC. As part of the new reactor licensing process for 10 CFR Part 52, a combined license enables the licensee to construct a plant and operate it once construction is complete. And if certain design-specific pre-approved sets of performance standards or ITAC identified in the combined license are satisfied. So essentially the ITAC are necessary and sufficient that when successfully completed by the licensee, provide reasonable assurance that the facility has been constructed and will operate in accordance with the combined license, the provisions of the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 as amended and the NRC's rules and regulations. So through licensing and inspection activities, when the NRC makes that determination that all ITAC are satisfied, the NRC would authorize the licensee to load fuel the initial plant startup and operation, which we also commonly call and refer to as the 52-103G finding. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Amy, your turn. Sure. Um, I'm Amy Chamberlain. I'm the Nuclear Development uh, Licensing Manager for Southern Nuclear, and I've actually spent most of my career working in Part 52. The last eight years I've been here with Southern working to, to build the Vogel 3 and 4 plants in Augusta, Georgia. Um, my team is based out of our Birmingham office, so we are responsible for license amendments, exemption requests, alternatives, and really being the forward-looking um, organization to take some of that uh, work um, off of the folks at the site. And so for the last eight years, we've been working very closely with Westinghouse and Zach's team to process these license amendments and various changes to our license. Um, so, but before I came to Southern, I also have um, worked in other Part 52 uh, um, applica applications and pre-applications. So I, seeing Vogel 3 and 4 actually get constructed and getting really, really close to coming online, it's really personally for me, um, something I wanted to see for our industry. So um, I'm really excited. Like you said, it's a very busy time um, at the at the site um, and we're working hard to get those ITAC closed. So that's, that's, um, that's my role um, for part 52. Thank you, Amy. Zach, what about you? Good morning, everyone. My name is Zach Harper. I'm the manager of licensing engineering here at Westinghouse. 
I have about 12 years of experience uh, working in Part 52. I started um, when we were still developing the design certification document. Um, and uh, my experience there was primarily working uh, in the ISG 11 process, which now is in Reg Guide 1.206, um, and supporting the ACRS meetings and um, uh, the various chapters, the responses to the NRC's request for in information. Um, I also supported the uh, the different uh, license applications um, for AP 1000, and as well as uh, I've also supported the, some international efforts uh, in in China to support their their licensing process as well. Um, <clears throat> since uh, the si design certification timeframe, I've uh, been supporting Amy and her team uh, to develop all inputs to their license amendment requests and the uh, non-LAR uh, departures the, that are written under uh, the Section 8 B5B criteria, as well as supporting the, the site teams uh, with ITAC closure, the engineering inputs. Um, I have a pretty unique job where I get to sit between um, the Westinghouse engineering team uh, that uh, defines the, the requirements and specifies the, the design for the plant. Um, I also work with the, the construction uh, engineers on site uh, to make sure that um, you know we understand their needs and how what we can do within the bounds of the license to make uh, their their job um, easy and easier and more efficient um, and then working with the the team the iTech team there on site to understand where they're struggling um, or in need of, of changes um, or clarification on, on requirements or what design inputs they need for, for ITAC closure. Um, I'm uh, excited to be with you today. I look forward to, to the questions that uh, we can answer. Thank you, everybody. So let's start with licensing. And this question is for Amy. Amy, from your organization's perspective, what do you perceive to be the greatest benefit to executing a Part 52 combined operating license? So I would say it's two parts um, and they're kind of intertwined, certainty and finality. So those, so certainty, um, certainty and what has been designed has been licensed and constructed. In the Part 52 process, we're required to construct in accordance with our license. And I will say during construction, this always, this hasn't always been a benefit and it sometimes has been a challenge, but I personally believe that when we become operational, we'll have certainty in our licensing places reflects our constructed plan um, through the work that we have done um, as the licensee um, through the various processes, including ITAC. And, and finality plays into that um, certainty. Uh, we have <clears throat> the, the DCD has finality and that through the process has uh, gained us certainty in the construction process also. I don't know if Zach, you wanna chime in on finality of the DCD. Yeah, I think that that's really one of the key advantages of, of uh, you know, the part 52 process where you get that finality and you get those safety issues um, identified and resolved up front in the process and resolved. And then through uh, the COL application, that, that design application process, that design has, has finality and that goes um, up through the startup the, of the plant. Um, I would say that, you know, just to, to um, jump off of the question that you have, another uh, key um, benefit of the part 52 process is standardization. Um, you know, for me, I, I perceive, uh, you know, the, the part 52 process, um, you know, the, the key advantages is standardization, design finality, resolving those key issues up front prior to construction. So for, for you know, the, the key success for, of a new nuclear build, um, you know, standardized design developed um, through a 
standard procurement and construction process and is, um, and is licensed in a standard approach. And it's perhaps the most salient lesson learned from you know the 1980s um, of their nuclear builds. And it was recognized uh, through the development of the uh, utility requirements document, the URD, um, and the promulgation of uh, the Part 52, and allowing that standard standardization um, and the, the the finality of it um, really gives a designer and a licensee the confidence um, to know that once that plant is, is constructed, it's going to start up and, and operate. Okay, uh, Vic, this question is for you. How has the NRC managed to cut license amendment review times in half compared to the review times for the operating fleet? Can you apply that for all licensing work done by the NRC? Oh, thanks, Omar. Um, so yeah, maybe a little, little background and context, because um, as, as Amy mentioned, um, there have been a fair number of licensing actions since the combined license in, from 2012. Um, we have, the NRC has issued I think, close to close, just over 200 licensing actions, which includes license amendments, uh, exemptions, and code alternatives. Um, and in the last four years, really since the formation of our office, the Vogel Project Office, and another group we'll talk about called the, the Vogel Readiness Group, the VRG, um, we've managed to, to keep our review time around six months, which is about half of the, the standard time for a, I'll call it a routine licensing action in the rest of the agency. And I think the most important thing is we've done it with the same incredibly high rigorous standard of safety. So there, you know, there's, there's, it's not like we've, we're just doing them quicker. It's still, it's a matter of being, finding efficiencies and, uh, and doing things kind of to the pace that's required for construction. Because you know, what's, what's different about Vogel, obviously, to the rest of the fleet, is they're building the plant and there's a, there's a need to, to uh, change the license as things come up, as construction is, is showing that, hey, the, the plant design needs to be a little different than what we originally uh, anticipated. And so how have we gotten there? Um, you know, the first thing is we have amazing people working on this. The, the project managers that we have on our team are extremely experienced in Part 52 and new reactors. Um, they are problem solvers. Uh, and so they, they know their craft. And again, it is a craft to be a, an NRC project manager that knows the regulation, that understands the engineering side of it and can, and can bring those two together towards safety. So we have amazing people that work on this who are incredibly motivated. And really, I'm gonna say a huge, uh, huge tip of the hat to communications that we've done for this project. Uh, I mentioned the Vogel Readiness Group. It's kind of, a, we, we took our lessons learned from the Watts Bar um, uh, reactivation and built this, uh, I'll call it a team, but really it was still our independent agent or independent parts of our uh, agency working together and just communicating nonstop. We've had, I think, 40 different VRG meetings in the last four years. And it's really just bringing together different parts of the agency. Uh, the Vogel Project Office chairs a uh, part of it. Uh, Nicole's group and Omar, your group, obviously, in, in uh, the Division of Construction Oversight and Region 2 chair it. And we have uh, other support from NRR, and we bring together all the different parts of the agency. So we bring together our tech groups, we bring together our legal side, we bring together our security folks, our AP folks, and we have discussions about what's coming um, and how we can solve the problems in front of us. Um, so that's internally. Externally, I, we've been meeting with the, uh, the licensee and with, with um, all our stakeholders um, very frequently to make sure that we see problems or see the, the questions that are coming up ahead of time and, and set ourselves up for success. We, we set up a cadence of weekly public meetings for licensing actions. You know, like two years ago, Amy, we were probably at a pace of, you know, having uh, close to 10 to 12 licensing actions in house at, at a time, right? And so those weekly meetings were really key for us to be able to, to talk about um, the issues that were in front of us and talk about the challenges. Um, a lot of pre-application uh, engagement. So those meetings were fantastic to be able to get a feel for what was coming. And quite frankly, again, it's, it's been thanks to those types of communications that the, the quality of the applications that come in from Southern have been good enough that have allowed us to, to, to complete our reviews in shorter time. So um, I think it's been just communications, communications, communication, which have really allowed us uh, to move at a faster pace than typical. Um, it, it'd be unfair for me, Omar, to say that the rest of the agency is just, yeah, just communicate and, and you know, fix it all. It's a completely different set of challenges and different, uh, different um scale that they're working on, but I do, I am very proud of the work that we have done at the agency in licensing. Um, I do think there are lots of really good lessons learned. So when we talk about lessons learned, there's lots of positives we can draw from the work we've done in licensing. 
uh, and again, help help build our efficiency in that place as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Oh, go ahead, Amy. Yeah, if I could just jump off of that. I, you know, the communication has been key, but it's, it's been kind of specific. And one of the things we did a number of years back was um, talk, um, work with the NRC to define what we say are high, low, and medium complexity laws. So we knew, Zach and I knew going in, what laws we thought were high complexity, just based on the amount of engineering work involved or um, the internal churn on creating the arguments of why we needed the license amendment. And so extending that those lessons learned that we had learned internally between our two organizations and opening up that line of communication with the NRC um, so that we are we were communicating, hey, this one's coming in, this licensing action is coming in, and we think it's medium complexity because of X, Y, and Z. It really helped the staff uh, prepare for those pre-application meetings so that they had the right folks um, in the room for, for those meetings. And then down the road, they could plan, okay, this one is a very high complex law. We are most likely going to need an audit of this work. And we would have all that planned in advance before we even submitted the licensing action. Um, so I think that was key. But then also on the, the other end, because you know, we're nuclear, we're always learning, we're always trying to get to excellence. We took a lot of feedback from the early days um, of submitting these licensing actions and really work them into our our next middle. Each time we learned, we learned something that, hey, we expect the staff to ask this question. And so making sure we had it up front in the submittals. And I, one interesting thing, I love data. Um, and you can see from our um, submittals, if you look in Adams at the number of REIs, they really decreased over time as we got better with that communication. Uh, so, and as Vic said, just because I like numbers, we actually have submitted 215 exemptions and alternatives to date, and we're currently on Amendment 188 for Unit 3 and 186 for Unit 4. Okay, we got a question for Vic. Vic, why are many advanced reactors designers not taking advantage of Part 52 and instead opting for Part 50? Yeah, um, great question. Um, and I, I listened in to some of, uh, I think it was uh, Tuesday's session on advanced reactors um, and uh, heard, I, th I think it was the folks at X Energy talking about looking at using Part 50. Um, you know, I my guess, again, this is a guess because I think we're, we're kind of focused on the, the back end of construction, but if you look at going way back to what it takes to get a, a certified design and then a COL, I imagine there's um, some calculations that go back to how much it's going to cost for that, that level of work. So, you know, we're the NRC is developing a Part 53, which is going to be a technology neutral framework, which I know just about you know, this much about, but um, that might be the future for advanced and smaller reactors. Um, I think part 50 and part 52 are still the standard for a large light water nuclear reactor. So if you're looking at a smaller plant, a small modular plant, um, you know, I don't know how that's all gonna fit together. So it's, it's a fair question. Um, it's probably better directed at, at those designers who are looking at advanced reactors. Um, and I think it's, it's gonna take in the, the totality of, of the process in the very beginning. If you look back at uh, uh, Zach, when you start with Zach, when Zach initially submitted the, uh, the DC for Westinghouse, we're talking, because 2000, I'm going to mess up my math here, 2002 timeframe is when you first applied, I think, for the DC for AP1000. So you're looking at a, a long span between that and where we are now. I think I'm sure those, I'm sure those go into it. Okay. So let's move on to ITAC for a little bit, and then we might go back, we, we might come back to licensing. So Nicole, what preparation was required for complex ITAC? such as structural reconciliation, the ASME ITACs, or lonely items. How has the NRC been inspecting ITAC and how does that relate to the 103G finding? Okay, thanks Omar. Well, first of all, you know, complex long lead ITAC, you know, as you said, one of the examples is the ASME safety related systems like reactor coolant system or the passive core cooling system. 
You know, for our inspections, we verify that these systems were designed, constructed, fabricated, installed, and, and tested to the required codes and standards. For these long lead ITACs, the NRC has been inspecting these activities since the beginning of the construction project. And as we're approaching the Unit 3 All ITAC Complete Milestone, we actually have relatively minimal inspections remaining compared to the amount of inspections that we've already completed. So to give you an understanding of our inspection process for these complex ITAC, so early on in the construction project, the NRC performed vendor inspections and observed the initial fabrication and construction you know, of key AP1000 components all over the world. A couple examples is we inspected major uh, reactor coolant system components and containment fabrication in Japan, uh, Korea, Italy. We had our inspectors out there at those facilities performing those inspections. Uh, we inspected safety related uh, key electrical component fabrication in Switzerland. Uh, we also went to the Wiley Labs in the United States to observe squib valve testing. And uh, we observed fabrication of modules, mechanical skids, ASME system piping assemblies at multiple different vendors. So after, following that, the NRC, we also performed multiple design specification inspections at the design authority, Westinghouse and, and SAC was present for, I would say most of those inspections in the corporate office. Uh, and this was to verify that the design of these KPAP 1000 component system structures would meet the acceptance criteria and that the design ensured that the most probable uh, transients, the most probable occurrences that would occur during uh, normal operation and operational transients would have least radiological risk. And those with extreme situations have the potential for the greatest risk of the least likely to occur. And essentially that's a licensing basis, uh, the, their accident analysis that is described in a licensee's updated final safety analysis report. And, and from there, the NRC inspection staff, we performed installation inspections at the Vogel site uh, we verified that the licensee constructed, welded, and performed non-destructive testing for ASME systems uh, in accordance with applicable code. You know, other inspection attributes included verifying welders were qualified, construction activities were reviewed and approved by authorized nuclear inspectors as required. And then our final aspects inspections verify that the asphalt conditions meet the design, and if they don't, how are they reconciled? You know, these inspections, they include pre-operational component and system testing, like verifying a flow rate or system function happened as designed, or performing uh, components or system, system walkdowns to verify compliance with seismic equipment reliability in harsh environments, like high pressure, temperature, moisture, such that the component system would perform its intended function during design of basis event. So to better inform and prepare our inspectors for these tests, including startup testing, the NRC and the Chinese regulator, National Nuclear Security Association or NNSA, participated in an ex uh, inspector exchange program that lasted several years and allowed approximately 18 NRC inspectors to travel to China to the Sandman nuclear power plants and witness firsthand some of these activities. You know, additionally, we were able to engage with Southern Nuclear and Westinghouse staff at Sandman, and that helped us to get an understanding of the differences or the changes that we would see in the U.S. AP-1000 plants. So definitely, as I described it, it was, it's a very complicated, long lead um, project plan for some of these ITAC, and it, it's happened over years. And so it, as Amy had said, and Vic had said, one of the most important key lessons learned is to communicate and communicate often. Um, some of these other activities like the structural reconciliation, and that is to uh, verify that the, the seismic category one class structures like containment shield building, you know, they didn't have the, the formal structure, the documentation structure like ASME code does in the system and vibes. So we met with Zach and Westinghouse and Southern Company years ago to determine what those final documents would look like. So 
all of these things are planned in advance. So, so a lessons learned is for complicated long lead activities, whether it's non ITAC or ITAC, it, it's very important to understand what the end product looks like so that you can plan and be prepared for those, those complicated issues. Thanks, Omar. Thank you, Nicole. So this question is for Zach. Zach, do you have any lessons learned about the easiness of in, to inspect ITACs? ITAC? Um, yes, yeah. So I would just maybe leverage a little bit off of Nicole's response. Um, she was talking about the lessons uh, learned related to the, the planning activities. I think um, for us, one of the key lessons in terms of inspectability for that, for those long lead um, type ITAC or the ITAC that we were having to perform uh, very early in the project was um, we had an, I would say an area of struggle where Westinghouse did not necessarily appreciate um, what a targeted ITAC meant, um, where, uh, you know, we would have activities such as EQ or, um, or ASME, and, you know, the NRC had identified those to be inspected, um, but those activities, for example, were already complete. So, you know, for us, you know, us thinking, okay, targeted ITAC inspection, uh, we will provide them the documentation at the end. Um, I think one of the lessons there for us was, okay, when they say targeted, we'll make sure that, you know, they're, we have to plan that out, make sure that they're on site at the vendor at Westinghouse. Um, most of the, the, the remaining targeted ITACs are, are on site, so it's um, not as, as applicable right now. But when we had first started, it was, I would say, taxing on both uh, Westinghouse and the NRC to, um, to, to make sure that to, I, to catch up and identify, okay, how can we satisfy the ITAC and uh, make sure that we had a good understanding of, of what needs to be completed. So I'd say that was one lesson learned for us. Um, another would be um, an area that for inspectability where um, there's not a basis document for an ITAC, um, like what you would have for a tech spec. So we really never go back and forth on what tech specs mean because there's a basis, there's analyses that they describe um, exactly what the intention of that tech spec is. There's not for an ITAC. And so um, I think the a lesson is, for us was, okay, for um, ITAC that, because you, you, ITAC really just have a, a very basic statement. They have a, a design commitment, a test, and then an acceptance criteria. And in some cases that can be taken different ways. So I think clear communication between uh, Westinghouse and Southern and Southern and the NRC on how that ITAC will be completed and the documentation that will be provided is an important part of, of uh, the inspectability for, for an ITAC. Um, another example would be um, during testing such as hot functional testing um, where uh, hot functional testing is a very dynamic um, evolution where a lot of tests are happening. It's a very coordinated event um, where the site, uh, where, the, where the plant heats up, tests are performed, um, and then the pl plant heats, uh, cools back down. Um, so for us, something that we had learned in China that we had applied here in the US uh, was to establish um, predictive analyses prior to that hot functional testing. Um, that way that, uh, you know, when the, when the test is run, uh, Westinghouse can do a quick post-test analysis, confirm that the ITAC, yep, the ITAC can be met and then move on to the next test. And then the ITAC paperwork can be uh, verified later. And then having a good understanding between Westinghouse and Southern, um, and if it's targeted, the NRC up front will, will look at what we plan to do. Um, but I think that's a, an area that I would say was a success um, is having that good plan established, having those predictive analyses 
already run that we we knew that we met, met the eye tech whenever we did our post test analysis um, and we could just move on to the next test and not have um, any delays thank you zach amy do you have anything to add yeah i'll, I'll just um echo um nicole and zach you know the having those that open communication especially with the uh, dynamic um construction situation, ensuring that the staff inspectors have access to, to see what they need to see to inspect um, is, is critical. And then on the, the ITAC language itself, verbatim compliance, um, I, I'll just say a little less than half of all the licensing actions we submitted were ITAC related. Um, we needed to make some sort of change. Um, so that verbatim compliance uh, I think that's a lesson learned. Um, it was for us, we learned while we went, but also for future applications, making sure that you're very clear on that language so that it can be inspected. And then, you know, as Zach said, there's no, there's no basis documents. So there's certain words that you would think we all understood what they meant, um, but there's a lack of definition of them. And so I, I would say that, ensuring that those specific words like as built were in your licensing basis in your tier one and your COL could really help a future applicant so that everybody is on the same page um, with the ITAC. Thank you. So this question is for SAC and it's a little bit long. Uh, so I'm gonna bear with me here. So the China AP 1000 project, even as a first of a kind plans, we're finishing about eight years and have already been in operation for a few years. But it is already more than 10 years for the construction of Vogel units three and four, which have been delayed again and again. From your perspective, what are the reasons for the delays for the Vogel project? Were any lessons learned from the China IP 1000 projects used to help the Vogel project? Um, okay, all right. So. I think just as a little bit of background, so there are four AP1000 uh, plants that are operating safely in, in China. Um, China uses uh, a part 50 type process uh, where it's kind of like a modified type, type 50 process where they have a, a PSR that's required um, to obtain a, a construction permit for the AP1000 that happened in around in the 2009 timeframe. Um, then they construct and to load fuel, they submit in, in, uh, in FSAR, a, a final safety analysis report um, to, the, to the China National Nuclear uh, Safety Administration, the NNSA. And then something that's a little bit different than part 50, they have something called an RFSR, which is a revised safety analysis uh, report, which they submit about a year after um, initial operation. And the plants, uh, as the commenter makes, uh, the, the plants have been operating safely in the United States for um, for quite some, uh, or have been operating in China uh, for a few years now, and they're, they're uh, performing very well. The in terms of the a comparison in between a this is really gets to a comparison of a part 50 to a part 52 process. Um, so I, I don't think that the delays um, either in China or uh, in, in here in the US were were result of the the regulatory process. The regulatory process is robust. It's can can be um, trying at times, no matter what process you follow. I don't think we're necessarily victims of a Part 52 process, so I don't necessarily agree with that part of the comment. Um, I think the, in terms of lessons learned, yeah, there were a lot of lessons learned that were brought um, from the China projects to uh, the U.S. Um, some some examples uh, were for, you know, we for the you know first plant first of a kind testing um, where the design certification um, has a subset of tests that were identified as being special where they 
where these tests are really there to demonstrate uh, phenomena uh, of the of the plant acting uh, and make sure that the phenomena of the plant is uh, uh, is performing as, as expected. Um, these are tests like um, natural circulation tests. There's um, the incontainment refilling water storage tank test, heat up test, um, so on and so forth. So those tests were run in China uh, and we were able to uh, demonstrate that the plants were the same build um, in, in China as here in the US. And we were able to successfully write license amendment requests to take advantages of, of those tests and show that the, um, uh, that, that, that the performance in the United States will be the, the same as the performance here, uh, or the, the performance in China. Um, so that was one example. Another example are, are you know, detailed design changes that are identified since they're, and it's the advantages of standardization where it's a standard design. They have the same plant, well, the same nuclear island in China as they do here. Their turbine building is a little bit larger because of uh, the 50 Hertz plant. but. You know those those design changes. We, um, as they are developed for China, they're reviewed for applicability, and if they're good, uh, good changes to be made, they're rolled right into uh, the uh, the design for the for the U.S. plants. Um, so uh, that's a very um, it's a it's an active process. It's it's ongoing as the the plants are built and constructed there. Um, so I think I'll pause there. If there's more questions later, we can address more. Okay, thank you, Zach. We have a question for Amy. Amy, regarding documentation of ITAC, there was a lot of preparation, including templates, tabletop, and exercise on how to close ITAC. Still, it seems the closure documentation for the final ITAC appears to have encountered a significant problem at the last moment holding up the 103G finding. What went wrong and what lessons are there for future Part 52 applicants? So we've mentioned that we've been working to close, as the comments suggest, we've been working to close ITAC basically since the beginning of the project. And you know what we see in the ICN submittals um, are a list of reference to principal closure documents. And at times these can be, uh, a lot, uh, hundreds of documents um, that go in, that are referenced in a single principal closure document. And so for many of the ITAC that are left, there are significant portions of them that are already completed. But as the comment mentions, there's, there is documentation that still needs to be completed. And we do hold ourselves to a very high standard. Um, we wanna complete this plant in a safe and um, quality way. And so we've gotta get the documentation right. Um, and the documentation comes after construction is complete. So that's, that's, where, um, that's where you would see um, some of why we haven't submitted all the ICNs for Google three and four at this point in time. Okay, thank you. So let's move on to the next section, uh, construction inspection. We have a question for Nicole. So Nicole, with so much construction going on and with inspection pro progress being hampered by the pandemic, how can you be sure that NRC has inspected what needs to be inspected to ensure that the plan is being built safely? Thank you, Alan. And, that, and that's a very good question, a very valid question for our inspection uh, group in our program. So, so during the COVID-19 pandemic, our inspection program kept track with Southern Nuclear Company's construction activities. And at the same time, we specifically prioritized, you know, our inspections to one, focus on the mission critical activities, but also during high transmission times, prioritize our inspector safety and the safety of the plant workers that we interface with. So during the entire pandemic, this did not change. We, our residents continue to connect daily with the, the key plant activities such as the plan of the day and work activity pre-job briefs. We also use both remote and on-site means to implement the construction program with that focus of uh, the uh, nearing 52103G finding. 
So we conducted inspections remotely when possible, but during times of high transmission, we specifically reserved the on-site inspection for those critical must-see activities, which included directly observing first-of-a-kind AP1000 testing and significant test activities that are typically only performed during once in the lifetime of the plant. So some of the examples that we were on site that we specifically saw face to face and observed during our inspections was the unit three reactor vessel and reactor coolant system hydrostatic test. Uh, we saw the unit three hot functional testing, the containment structural integrity tests and integrated leak rate tests for containment for both units three and four. And we also had inspectors on site to observe uh, installation of safety related items that become inaccessible once construction is complete or when the plant is operating. So for example, we were on site observing the rebar installation and concrete placement for the unit four seismic class one structures like containment and shield building. Um, but I will note that, um, you know, as I, ex as I discussed in the earlier section about these long lead ITAC, you know, we have done so many different types of inspections over the years that you know, we have confidence in those activities that we've inspected. And when there are non-conformances identified, then we go and inspect those as well. But again, our inspections are not focused on one specific activity, but we ensure that those mission, mission critical activities are, are observed. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Vic, what have you taken from the NRC's transformation to be a risk-informed regulator for the construction inspection program? Um, so and I'll, let me jump back because you know, I think Nicole had a good point. I want to key off and then I'll answer that question. But I, I, I'm, I'm, Nicole, you're bringing back some really good memories of, well, good, relative memories of early on in the pandemic of our discussions about um, how we keep our people safe and uh, you know, what was going on at the site. And I, I remember pretty early on, I think, I think Southern was one of the very first utilities to have a massive testing facility outside the plant and they were communicating their cases. So we were able to make a judgment call as to whether it was safe for our folks. So, uh, you know, um, Nicole, I know we, we sound like we're in the same organization, but we obviously um, have plenty of discussions and we don't always agree, but I, I remember being incredibly impressed with uh, your side of the house with just making sure our people were safe, but at the same time, we're also, getting the job done to make sure that we're, we're looking at the activities we need to look at uh, and then making sure our folks weren't in harm's way. Um, as far as transformation goes, um, Amy, Amy keyed on data earlier on and um, I, like, I like jumped on my, I probably didn't notice it, but I jumped on my chair when she said data because that has been to me, we're in the information age, the biggest, the biggest ability for us to, to think differently about how we do what we do. We, we developed a construction inspection program you know, over the course of probably a decade uh, with an idea of how construction is going to play out in the first ever part 52 and of course it's not going to be exactly as you design it right it's just there's, there's no we're human so we're going to we're not going to be able to design that perfectly so being able to look back now at, at several years of experience and using that data um, to look at where we can be more efficient um, where have we seen enough of certain activities when it comes to looking at ITAC and really you know spend our time um, in, in the right places um, has been uh, for me eye opening. We, we built um, a dashboard relatively early on in the Vogel project where we, we just gathered up everything we could. I mean, uh, where we build our time for hours, or our folks were, what the special procedures we were using. Um, and, and that was um, to me key, and just eye opening for us to be able to go down to Region 2 and say, hey guys, here's what we got data wise. You know, where can we work together to adjust our inspection program? Um, and what are you seeing as inspectors as, as the key places to go? So to me, transformation has been just this, this, use, this wonderful use of data uh, to be able to, to tailor our program to be more efficient. Thank you, Vic. Uh, we have a question for, for Nicole. Nicole, can you explain more specifically the remote inspections of ITAC versus completion on site? How does remote inspection of ITAC work? Okay, thank you, Omar. Well, essentially, as the definition or of the acronym ITAC, it's inspection, testing, analysis, and acceptance criteria. So those all have different functions and abilities to inspect those areas. So inspections can be done either on site, they can be done remotely, uh, but definitely the, um, the testing or the acceptance criteria and the analysis is all 
prime candidates for remote activities, remote inspections, because you're, as, as Amy said, and as Zach said, some of these documents are thousands of pages, and, and that's just one document that supports a closure of an ITAC. So, you know, there are definitely opportunities to, to do remote inspections. Uh, we actually, you know, before the pandemic, there was, when we had big team inspections, we would have a one-week off-site inspection looking at this documentation, and then we would have on-site inspections as well. So that's no different than we did before the pandemic. Uh, to handle the specific inspections that we wanted to do during the pandemic to observe testing or their inspection activity, then we would be very deliberate that we'd send folks on site to see those activities, we'd coordinate with the licensee, when is that specifically going to happen? So there was no compromise to our inspection program where we missed opportunities. Uh, we just did it differently. Thank you, Nicole. Yes. Amy, uh, from Southern's pers perspective, can you tell us about the NRC's findings on cable separation? Yeah. Um, so we, we take these um, findings very seriously. Uh, we've taken corrective um, actions um, in the instances of separation nonconformances. We put measures in place to prevent reoccurrence going forward. As we complete construction, we main focus on safety and quality as our top priorities. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Now this question is for SAC. SAC, from a design authority perspective, what are the key processes you have implemented to ensure the constructed plan aligns with the design and licensing basis? Um, yeah, well, this is a good question. This is probably, if I were to list my lessons learned, this would probably be number one. Um, and I think that, uh, so I guess a little bit of background when we had initially um, you know, when Southern received their design or their construction uh, or their combined operating license in the 2012 timeframe, um, within, I would say, like one or two months, uh, we started to identify at site there were um, things being implemented at the field um, that were not in alignment with the license. Um, so we had, uh, you know, had paused to take a close look. Um, and I think, and, and at that point we began to implement uh, changes within the Westinghouse, uh, within the Westinghouse process uh, to ensure that the design aligns with the, the, what's actually constructed in, at the constructed plant. Um, so, and we really haven't had significant issues um, uh, you know, after those those big lesson, those uh, big changes were implemented, and so what do we do? So what we didn't really have the benefit of NEI ninety six oh seven Appendix C at that time because it wasn't written. Um, it was written after our lessons. Uh, the what we the primary thing was we established a licensing basis review for every document that was developed. And you can imagine how many documents that we, we create. Uh, we perform a licensing basis impact determination to confirm that that document aligns with the, uh, the applicable FSAR, so the Vogel FSAR in the, in the other licensing documents. Um, and there's, we developed a very robust procedure uh, qualification program for people that uh, are developing documentation, um, qualification program for people that are identifying nonconformances um, at site and reviewing those nonconformances, and um, really a, a culture um, a, a culture shift uh, to ensuring, like what Amy had said earlier, verbatim compliance. Um, uh, to the license and making sure that we're meeting every word that that is said. Uh, we've done other things uh, as well. We've done compliance reviews. We've taken certain scopes of of work. Um, we've picked uh, you know the commodities within the the plant, the pumps, tanks, valves, etc., and go through their uh, 
their specifications, their vendor documentation uh, that are, are sent to the vendors and the vendor sends back to us uh, to confirm that those uh, commodities are within the bounds of the licensing basis. Um, we've also done other reviews. Instead of picking a, a commodity, we've um, taken a, a scope of the, the construction documents on site um, to check to make sure that they, they're, they're within the bounds of the license. Um, so what we did in terms of passing the lessons learned when we wrote NEI 9607 Appendix C um, in section, I think 411, we added, um, you know, basically a sentence, a few sentences in there that says, hey, as during the construction period, um, you know, you, you document your basis for no impact of the license as you go along. Um, so that was kind of our our attempt at passing those lessons to, to others in the, in the industry. And it, um, you know, it's, I think it, it's important, you know, to, to pass those. And the other is, is really what I said before is the verbatim compliance, making sure that, um, that when we wrote the, the design certification, it seemed like a good idea at the time to write, you know, ambiguous statements um, like generally, or this is representative, but that was a good idea at the time because we thought, oh, this is gonna give us wiggle room um, as we go forward. And as it turns out, it's really difficult to inspect to, to that, that type of language. And so throughout the construction, a lot of the changes that we've actually made are not necessarily design changes, they are um, changes to uh, improve the clarity of the license to, to very clearly state what we are going to do. Because there's a, a lot of detail in there, but um, even, with, even with that said, it was, um, you know, loading that license with uh, the variances uh, that, um, that, you're, that we were going to take, and in some cases getting NRC approval to do that when we were required to, um, was a very important lesson for us uh, to, and, um, you know, those that work in Westinghouse on the AP1000, um, it's really a, a culture. Does what you're doing comply with the license? And it's, it's a question that, you know, our group receives a lot of questions every day um, on that that questioning attitude. Hey, can I do this? Can I do that? Um, and and when necessary, we get Amy's team in, involved and to make sure that they're comfortable um, with with those those decisions. Okay, thank you, Zach. And we have one more question for uh, Vic and Nicole. Okay, sorry. Okay. So will the NRC establish a similar branch or office like DCO or BPO during the construction of future SMR projects, small modular reactor projects? Uh, so Nicole, you can you can jump in too, but I, I hope so because I think I think the combination of BPO and DCO has has worked well. Um, you know, as we start putting our lessons learned together, um, I'm sure we'll we'll do the environmental scan to see what the future of nuclear power looks like and put together the right type of organizations that combine the expertise, um, whether it's ITAC or whether it's a Part 50 based plant with the inspection uh, staff. Uh, again, I think, you know, looking at the success we've had really with the, the VRG, this vocal readiness group, which brought together all the different parts of the agency, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, that's just, that's almost like common sense for good communications and how we put it together. So um, I think we're probably still early on. I think we've just gotten a construction application for Keros in right now. Um, and New Scale obviously has their certified design, but um, I'm, sh I'm sure uh, our senior managers uh, will, will be looking very hard at what's the, what's the right organizational structure for, um, uh, for when we're ready for, for construction, uh, construction inspection and new plans. And I can't agree with you more. Vic, because uh, you know one of the one of the key lessons learned, and I know that's the next uh, topic, but that the vocal readiness group really was a project as a, a a fantastic lessons learned from Watts Bar that we were able to not only communicate inspection licensing issues, but we we're also looking at you know the logistics, so to speak, or the budget or staffing of all of these different activities. So it's it's a very 
it's a, a, a very solid structure on how to look at those, those different aspects of an inspection program and oversight program. And the, the one note I would say is that, you know, whatever the organization looks like, we have in this panel, we have a senior manager of nuclear uh, from the NRC, Mr. Omar Lopez. He is our champion for the small modular reactor program. So I know that we will get the DCO, the Division of Construction Oversight, uh, feedback lessons learned into what that project looks like in the future. Thank you very much. Before we move on to the next section, there's a question here, Nicole, for you. How would ITAC work if the majority of the advanced reactors would be manufactured off-site and installed with minimal on-site construction? So that's a great question. And that goes, that models exactly what we did for the AP1000, that the vendor inspectors, uh, which went to facilities all over the world, were key inspection attributes for completing ITAC. So whether it's done on site, it's done in a fabrication shop, uh, all of them are verified to have the, the nuclear standards for appropriate quality assurance program. Then they're, they're inspected uh, with all the rigor that an on-site inspection would perform as well. So it, it would be the same model. And Nicole, okay. you're bringing back uh, good memories. And before I used to wear a tie, I used to wear a polo shirt and a hard hat. And I remember I was, uh, I got a chance with the veteran inspection staff to travel to Korea. We, we watched the the pouring of the ingot, you know, that, that piece of the just lump of metal that eventually formed uh, the reactor vessel. And so uh, we have we have inspectors who are able to go all over the world and inspect uh, these vendors that are building plants. I, I do think we will have to think a little differently about other plants. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be a different model versus, it's likely to be a different model versus uh, these large construction sites on site. So, um, you know, I, I think that's something we're looking at too. And I think we'll have to be um, cognizant of, of a, a changing world and how we can best adapt to that. Yes, I absolutely agree with you there. And, and we have other types of facilities like the fuel, many fuel facilities, you know, that we can leverage lessons learned from multiple business lines, not just uh, construction reactors or operating reactor business lines. Yeah. Okay, one more question for Nicole. Nicole, has the NRC considered incorpor incorporating regulatory oversight guidelines to supplement the reactor oversight process significant determination process to help the I to remove ITAC to some of the signific non significant inquiries. Okay, um, that I, I will. Uh, I'm going to phone a friend, uh, Mr. Vic Hall, because what we do is uh, for both the inspection process and the oversight, the program office, we are continuously reviewing our procedures, our manual chapters, to ensure that. Uh, they're not only risk informed, but when we come across lessons learned that we are absolutely discussing them, how do we incorporate them real time? So we're not waiting for the next project to make changes to our existing program. Vic, anything else you wanna to add to that? Yeah, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little more when we talk to lessons learned, but we, we are a learning organization that's always looking to get better. Um, you know, as, as I, I heard uh, Amy and Zach talking earlier about um, the compliance versus safety, it, it would jump down and I think I have an ITAC war story here. Um, and, you know, I think we're, we're painting a picture of everything being rosy, but not everything has worked perfectly. Um, and one of my, one of my well, least favorite ITAC stories um, was I got a call, Amy, at one point from one of your, your colleagues uh, who was working on ITAC saying, hey, we have a, there's an ITAC that's very specific because we need to test our accumulators, these tanks of water. And to test them, you, we need to fill them with nitrogen because the ITAC very specifically says, test them by filling with nitrogen air. Now that said that um, because in when the plant's operating, they're filled with nitrogen, 100% nitrogen. But to test them, you could use anything. You could use any kind of gas. It, would, it would, would not change the flow, which was the acceptance criteria. And the question was, well, can we just use air, which actually is 70 some percent nitrogen anyway. And you know, it, was, it was a tough call. And, and legally, the, the language of the law compliance said, now it's gotta be nitrogen. Um, you know, we it would be a relatively easy license amendment, but you're talking about time to do that. And in a construction environment, that just, it's not a realistic. So I know the folks at Southern had to go find tanks of nitrogen to fill this, this accumulator full of nitrogen to comply with the, the letter of the law for the ITAC language. Um, and that was a shame to me. That was, that was, okay, there's lessons that can be learned there where we really should be focusing more on safety versus just the compliance. Again, Southern did the right thing. 
we, we were, you know, it was the letter of the law. It was t- it's tier one information. So it was, it was relatively unbendable, but it pointed to, uh, again, certainly if you look forward to writing ITAC language uh, to be um, more realistic and just again, taking, taking what we've learned from the last uh, uh, year of construction, uh, I think we can make improvements. And so along those lines, uh, you know, we think we're always looking to improve our guidelines for the reactor oversight process for the, S- for the significance determination process. So we're always looking to improve uh, and looking for feedback there as well. Okay, thank you, Vic. Uh, let's go to the last sec- uh, section, applying lessons learned to advanced reactors and future applications. This question is for Amy. Amy, what should the NRC do differently if, when we have another reactor construction project? Differently? I, I think we have to look at what we've done well um, in this, in what we've done for three and four. I mean, the, the communication, the VRGs, we've already um, mentioned those. Those are the key features that we need to keep those communication lines open with the NRC. I know when I first came on the project eight years ago, there were some lines open, but maybe they're, they're not anything like what we have today that we've, um, we've built and we've added to over time. Um, so I, I think those would be key features to keep moving forward. We kind of touched along um, the CROP, the inspection um, process. I think there's further opportunity for that our inform uh, that process. And then I, I think we have more lessons we are going to learn as we come, as three and four comes online. Um, particularly, focus for me is how is tier one going to affect us as we are operating? So um, those would be key things, I think, um, lessons learned, things NRC should consider um, going forward. Anything from you, Zach? Well, I, I agree with, with Amy. I think that a lot of the the struggles and towards the beginning of the project, they have since been resolved with really good communication. And I think that, you know, carrying that in, they've been implemented at, at site. So I think the, the process that, that we have now today um, and with the, the open lines of communication with the headquarters organization and with region two, um, the on-site inspectors, I think that is what really needs to be taken forward. Thank you. This question is for Vic and Nicole. What advice would you give your NRC colleague who are building a construction inspection program for advanced reactors? Who's going first? We want paper, rock, scissors, who's going first? Go ahead, Vic. I just volunteered, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's a great question. I, mean, I think everyone's obviously interested in what's going to happen with advanced reactors. Um, I know that uh, so Mo Shams, who's a director um, in, in Danu, and they're, they are working on what is a, a pretty uh, fascinating and very interesting framework for, for Part 53, which, which is it is meant to take us forward for advanced reactors. Um, I'm, you know, from what I've seen from them, it's been, again, just, just really, really cool work. And that's, you know, really, really did. it's Vogel's great. I'm focused on Vogel. It's the best project in the world. Uh, but looking forward, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. And so, again, you're building a regulatory structure that's going to work for many different technologies. Um, and, you know, I think, I'm sure, I know for a fact that they've been taking into account all the lessons learned from, from what we've done in the past. Um, and we will be putting together lessons learned for this product as well, which, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to sharing with them and, and helping, helping them develop the program. Um, I do want to give a plug for our lessons learned because I, I know that we, we uh, so our, our behind the scenes uh, uh, session moderator, Jim Gaslovic, is leading our effort to, uh, to put together our lessons learned kind of from this stage of part 52. Um, our goal is once 52, if, once, one, once the plan goes online and one, and one of three G, uh, we have the first 52103G. We're looking at having uh, public meetings and gathering more feedback and really capturing. I think we have the responsibility to capture these lessons learned from the last uh, last few years to, to get to see to describe what has gone well, what can we improve, and help that feed the future for advanced reactors. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to from Vic's perspective, because I agree with everything that he said, 
is that um, the the one definite recommendation is the communication, as as Zach and Amy both said, uh, having those open, direct, um, understanding each other and your communication styles. You know that's very important to get through if you want to be efficient and effective getting through some of these complicated issues. That that's when you really challenge your communication and your working uh, status because they can get very difficult. And so establishing open communication is very is a, a key lessons learned from the very beginning. Um, also having, I would recommend a VRG like uh, organization within the NRC. And the benefit of that is you're having key senior managers across the agency that you can leverage and resolve issues in a very timely manner or get the resources to do so. So that was when we restarted that up after Watts Bar, that was a, it really quickly promoted a, a faster resolution of some of these complicated issues. Uh, from an inspection standpoint, I would say that, you know, to continue to have a formal uh, oversight process uh, that allows um, repetibility consistency, you have a defined methodology of how you're doing inspections, you understand what your inspection scope is and when it's complete. And then big picture, I would say organizational flexibility and agility, you know, with different things happening in the industry, um, with, with VC summer when, when that situation occurred, and just the different challenges you face, you, including COVID, you really have to have an organization that can turn on a dime and still keep safety its number one focus. So those are the recommendations I would I would have for lessons learned. Thank you. So before we go to the next question, Vic, I, I have a follow up for you. You mentioned that the BPO office is sponsoring a lessons learned effort for the the Vogel Project Three and the Vogel Project Three and Four. How do you plan to engage the public so you can get their uh, input? Um, thanks, Omar. We, we are planning um, public meetings. Um, what's kind of nice about the virtual world is it's a lot easier to gather folks all around, from all around the world really to, to meet in, in forums like this. So if there is a silver lining from the pandemic, it's, it's the kind of these technologies. But uh, I think in everything we do, um, we are trying uh, to, to get as much feedback uh, from all stakeholders. Uh, and so for the lessons learned, um, absolutely, we will we will be looking to to, to uh, again engage engage the public, engage all of our stakeholders, um, and and you know I'd like to hear the criticism. I want to hear where, where we could have done better, um, and uh, and and feed those those lessons learned to improve the future. Because I, I, again, I think we've done great work, but we're in humans, um, and we are a learning organization committed to to getting better and learning. So. Um, Absolutely, there will, there will be follow up on lessons learned. And um, I will say one more thing when it, when it comes to communications, you know, we're, we're not the IRS, if you call us, you don't get a reported line. If you email us or call us, you're getting a person. And so if you have questions, if you want to follow up, if you have things you want to feed us beforehand, you have my email address, you have Omar's email address, you have Nicole's email address and phone numbers, reach out to us anytime. Um, Cause we do want to hear back. We do want to hear from as many possible stakeholders. Uh, and we do want to engage as many people as possible. To, again, the more the more opinions we get, more diversity of thought we get, the better we will be in, in the future. Thank you, Vic. We have a question for Zach. Zach, how much did having a reference combined operating license help licensing and construction of Vogel, or did it, it did not help? Well, I think it did help. The so the the so take take back in, in time, the, there was a, a design center working group that was um, made up of, um, you know, TVA, Southern Nuclear, uh, SCANA, there was Duke, uh, well, Progress at the time. Um, and they made up a, a, a group and the, the Arcola originally was Belafont. Um, it transitioned to Vogel, maybe the 2000, eight time frame ish um, but uh, ultimately what the, the that group did and they partnered there's another organization called new start um, and really what they were they were doing is um, establishing uh, what a part 
uh, 52 license would would look like and what those COLA applications uh, would look like. So, and the reference kind of set the the standard set it set you know what everyone else followed, and that just contributed to you know the standardization of the plant because when all the words in the in the licensing basis are the same, then you know that you have one issue, one solution, one implementation into multiple at multiple plants. So, I think that um, you know that that process what what happened with with New Start and um, you know what, part of what they were doing was they were closing COL information items. It's like uh, COL information items are things that are specified in the DCD requirements to a COL that. Um, need to be closed. And they were developing plans for closure. And some plan plans, closure would be, hey, Westinghouse, go do this work. In some, some cases, it would be some site-specific evaluation. Others, it would be ways that um, could be addressed uh, by a licensee in a, in a standard way, in, in, in the same. So I think that that ARCOLA process was helpful um, in, in bringing the, the licenses, moving the ball forward, moving the licenses through, through that COLA application to a, to a COL. Um, now, obviously there's only one plant being built, um, but even, even still, I still think it, it was advantage having all those utilities involved because frankly, the, there was not a part 52 license before. There, there wasn't a, a COL that, had, act, had intended to build. And um, having inputs from different utilities into a standard um, way of submitting a license, I think was a big advantage because it um, you know, established an, an industry uh, precedent for, for that application that was ultimately approved and, and is um, hope, you know, being constructed and will hopefully start soon. Thank you, Zach. So this question is for, for, for everybody here. So given the chance to go back in time, what would you do differently? Let's start, who wants to start? Don't make me pick. Okay, let's go with Amy. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> Let me think about it for a minute. Um, so, I, I think- do you want me to I'll, I'll go in. I, you know, I, I'll be honest. My my realm of thought is licensing. You know that that's where I think, and I think I'd go back to um, the verbatim compliance and um, what Zach mentioned on how many changes we needed to make, and not just ones that required NRC approval, but um, the the departures that we made through our own fifty fifty nine like process that we had to provide so much clarification in the UFSAR to allow for construction, to allow for um, uh, inspectability. I think if I had it to do over again, with all the knowledge I have now is to go back to those days. You know, it's, it's easier to do something right, you know, do it once. I tell my kids all the time, you know, it's better to do it right once than having to go back and do it again. And so I, that would be the only thing, um, that, not the only thing, but I think that'd be the major thing that I'd, I'd go back and do is look at the, the DCD um, and the uh, Vogel 3 and 4's COL application from in that light. Zach, yeah. did you want to add? Well, I, I agree with you. I, I think that the, that's good. What it, not to repeat what you said, I'll, I would also bring up um, the, I think the implementation of tier two star, um, you know, if I had to go back and do it all over and give someone, <laughs> um, you know, tell someone the future, I would uh, talk to them about tier two star. I, I don't think that um, that part of the, the, the regulation was necessary. I think that we could have done other things in the license. Um, you know, since, since that time we've, we've implemented, um, you know, certain criteria or Southern has implemented certain criteria in their, in their COL to address that. But, um, you know, 
if I could go back in time, then tier two star would be at the at the top of the list to to either identify those requirements, put them in an ITAC somehow, or identify those requirements and say, hey, this is just like an FSAR. We have to comply with the FSAR no matter what. It's you know a tier two tier two star requirement in terms of compliance. What's actually put in its final resting place, you know, we're required to follow that just as much as we are to follow words in the FSAR. And um, you know, we can. The industry has demonstrated uh, the use of fifty fifty nine for years safely um, across the industry. You know, across the industry through the operating plants and. Um, you know, I think that uh, that that was probably a bigger lesson learned that that has been a- implemented in several of the new, uh, the more recent design certifications where they they don't have that. So um, I am happy to see that others have been able to take advantage of that lesson. And Zach, at a very very high level, could you explain what Tier Two Star is for the for the audience that they might not know? Oh, sure. Is? Um, so in a design certification, there's two tiers. There's tier one, which is made up of mostly the ITAC. There's some other information. Um, but that anytime you change, touch anything in tier one, uh, it requires uh, the NRC's prior approval. The In tier two, that's what a traditional operating plant's uh, final safety evaluation report looks like. Um, it it has the same structure. It follows the rate guide 1.70 uh, format. And, uh, you know, there's provisions within 5059 that allow you to uh, make, that allow utility to make changes uh, without prior NRC approval. Um, within part 52, however, there is an additional criteria that was added to the design certification rules that information that is bracketed and italicized and has a little star next to it um, requires NRC approval to change. Um, so that at a high level, that's that's really, it's a, a information that a traditional operating Part 50 plant would be able to make changes to without NRC approval. It's for, um, you know, for part 52 plants, that information requires it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nicole, you wanna go next? Sure. The one thing I would note if looking, if I could go back in time, is I would look at a possible more flexible inspection program. And I say that because we created, you know, from the, from the construction reactor oversight process, we have, as I talked about earlier, we have manual chapters, we have inspection procedures, and that framework was outstanding in really looking at types of inspections so that you had a good broad uh, regulatory breadth of inspections that happened uh, over this huge project. In developing those, we also made inspection plans that in some times, in some cases, were very restrictive and didn't allow us the flexibility that we have since incorporated into our program. And I say that because the benefit we had and the foresight we were having at the time was the nuclear res- renaissance is happening. We need to be prepared for multiple uh, new construction projects at different phases. So it was, it was very important to have that kind of rigor and structure. But as we worked through Vogel's inspection, sometimes we found areas that we could make improvement and changes. And so Vic had referenced it earlier in this discussion that we worked with VPO several years ago and we went and we essentially looked at every single activity that we had done to date, the hours, inspection hours we had done in certain areas, functional areas, types of valves, welding companies. And so we were able to go back and say, put some more flexibility into our program because we did that assessment. So again, Vic said it perfectly. We're, uh, we're a learning organization. We're never going to be perfect, but we, if we have that mindset to, to keep looking forward, we're not stuck in, in, in something that's not flexible or agile. 
Um, but that is the recommendation I would make uh, if I was going back in time. Thank you. Vic, what do you have for us? But so many things I could change if I could go back. I, mean, I probably wouldn't have gray hair from, <laughs> from you know, change. And there are a lot of nuggets today of, I think, just ideas that talk about the history of how things were developed. And, and Zach, when you talked about um, targeting of ITAC, and I, I still remember early discussions when we were talking about um, should we be, the, have a public list of targeted ITAC and having to balance that idea of independence and being offering clarity and, and openness to what we were going to inspect. So I think in every area, there's things I would love to go back to and change. But I think along the way, we've incorporated all those lessons learned. I think we've tried along the way to, to, to improve along the way. So I, I appreciate the comments on tier two star. I know that's been a sore point. Um, certainly the idea of this compliance versus safety and looking at the language of the ITAC. Um, boy, if I could go back and, and rewrite some of those ITAC, I'd, I'd love to, because I think there's, there's certainly room for improvement um, in those. But having said that, I think we've, we've done a, um, an admirable job, again, you know, making the magic happen, making safety come through these words that, uh, that other humans have to understand. So uh, I'm proud of what we've done. Um, I, I know that uh, there are plenty of things we can improve from. And, uh, and looking forward to, to making a, a, better, a better, safe nuclear industry. Thank you, Vic. So from, from the conversation this morning, uh, I have heard the following themes, like for example, communications, Communic early communication and frequent communication is very important to make sure that all the stakeholders are on the same page and to avoid problems down the road. Also, we heard that uh, when you're, developing your design certification, your license, your ITAC. It's very important to make sure that you're very specific and you're clear to avoid confusion down the road because every person has a diff will have a different, many interpretations of what you originally intended to write. So anything before closing, anything else that you guys would recommend or, or give any advice to the people that are trying to put in place new advanced reactors? And we have four minutes. If you were keen for the day, for a day, what would you change? I'll just say the, the folks that have joined today, uh, the last day of the Rick is usually the tough one that, that people are like tuned out from, from all the speeches. So if, if you're on the call today and you're listening, you are probably way ahead of the game and understanding of very fair processes and your interest in, in part 52 and everything else. So, um, you know, I, I thank you for listening certainly today. Um, again, I would, I would welcome or invite you to, um, to stay engaged, to give us a call if you have questions about what you heard today and, and talk more because I, I think it's important to keep dialogue going. Communication is gonna be across everything. And we talked a lot about communication. Um, I, I, what I do wanna add about that is it's, it's just, it's being deliberate about how you communicate. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, we're gonna communicate, I'm gonna talk more, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have more meetings. Gosh, no one wants more meetings, but it, it, I think we've been very deliberate in structuring um, who we're bringing in, how we're bringing folks in, making sure we're engaging the public. I mean, we've had, we've had vocal readiness groups uh, down near the, the site to make sure we're, we're um, able to reach the local communities, which is you know, critically important for what we do in the NRC. So, being deliberate um, and, uh, and learning from the lessons for it is, is going to be key. Zach? You're on mute, Zach. Sorry. So I, I don't think that I have any other really lessons learned for, for the advanced reactors. I, th I think that... Um, you know, I think that a lot of them are in their are in their pre-application stages at this point, and I think that um, you know they're they're and they're still developing their their technology. I would there I would say that there is a lot of um, you know I, I get a lot of questions on on Part Fifty Two, and I I think that. You know there are balances between Part 50 and Part 52. The you get um, the advantages of the design finality, and you get the advantages of uh, of the standardization, and you get certainty. Um, and those issues, in all the issues, resolved up front. That's big advantages. The, the downsides is that it can be challenging during construction to make changes to that license because you have a license and. Um, so, and as 
the plant is being constructed, uh, you don't your you don't want the delays in um, you know don't, don't want the licensing process to to cause cause delays. Uh, so you know it, it's really a, a balance on on what the advanced reactors and on what their strategy is their licensing strategy is going to be. Um, but and I think that the the challenge is building a, a, a nuclear reactor is is challenging no matter what, no matter what process you follow. Um, part 50, part 52, part 53, it's all going to be challenging. There's not a, a process that's going to make things just easy. Um, so, but I think that, you know, the, some of the key lessons that we talked about today apply regardless of, of what process that, that we're following. And, um, you know, I just thank everybody that uh, stuck around at this point uh, for their for their time. And uh, I appreciate sharing sharing with you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Nicole or Amy, any last words? Again, I, oh, go ahead, Amy. Uh, just real quick, I just, I haven't said it, and I almost always say it when I talk to folks. If you look at unit four, we have applied lessons we learned on unit three right to unit four. And so, as Zach said, standardization, um, we have two plants next to each other that we're building the same, and we're learning and applying it. Things just go smoother on unit four. Um, so I think um, to future applicants, that is something you should definitely, you know, look at that, even though part 52 might be difficult at times to construct, once you apply those lessons, you, you do gain a lot of benefits going forward. Go ahead. Thank you. Nicole? Yes, the only thing I would add is that, you know, today you heard three different independent uh, perspectives. We all have our individual roles in this, uh, but I can tell you that from what you heard today, that every one of us, every position, our number one focus is the safe construction and operation of these nuclear power plants. So, you know, that's, that's the commonality that we have even in our, in our different independent roles. Thanks, someone. Well, thank you all of you for your participation and sharing your thoughts about how we'll, of our lessons, lessons learned of implementing the part 52 for Vogel 3 and 4. So that's all we have. Thank you very much and have a great day.